Um, so today we're going to have a very different recitation than what we had so far. Uh, because many people had problem with the question involving all the derivations in the midterm, uh, we're going to go through some derivations. We're going to start with a question that looks very similar to what you had in the midterm. And then we're going to look at a more complicated and more general example. So I hope you have all brought with you paper and pen to write down stuff. And OK. So we're going to start with this simple example. We have data drawn from a normal distribution with, new, with mean mu and covariance matrix sigma. And we assign a prior to the mean of that distribution, mu zero sigma zero. And later on, we're going to move to the case where we assign a prior to both the mean and the covariance at the same time. So for this simple example, uh, we can start by deriving you, you will have to derive the log likelihood as you did for the meter. So you can start doing that. Give you like around 10 minutes, 5, 10 minutes to do that, depending on how much you need, and we'll go on like that. And you can ask me any questions you have throughout the way. Okay, for those of you who haven't gone through the first part yet, um, that's the first step you need to use, where you use base rule. Use combine the prior with the likelihood and obtain the posterior. And then you need to simplify that for this distribution that we gave you. You're all done? I can see that some of you are not done, so you should say it like. OK. <laughs> so the answer to this question is this. Um, you derive the log posterior. You take the log of that form, where you have used base rule to to write down the posterior distribution. Um, and when you take the form of the normal, if you omit the constant terms that do not depend on mu, you get this simplified expression. The blue part comes from the prior, which is just the part where mu appears in the normal distribution, the exponential, the exponent of the exponential. And the red, pink part comes from the likelihood, which is also a normal. And mu only appears on the exponent again. That's why you keep only those two terms. So write down that expression, because now you will have to derive the gradient of that with respect to mu. So this is the way you derive the gradient of the likelihood, written in as many steps as possible. So you use this rule of linear algebra for both the prior part um, and the likelihood part. The reason this simplifies to two times the sigma zero inverse is because sigma is a covariance matrix and so it is symmetric. So sigma inverse equals sigma inverse transpose. That's why in the midterm view we're also giving you a simplified version of this rule which said 2ax was for the symmetric case for when a is symmetric. In this case sigma inverse is symmetric. So it simplifies to two times that. And you apply this rule two times. You apply it once for the prior term and once for the likelihood term. And you get this simplified expression for the, for the gradient of the log posterior. Um, so you should write that expression down again because you're going to use it uh, later on. So if you have written it down. OK, so now you will have to derive the Hessian, so the gradient of that with respect to mu. Um, and you can do that. Do this quicker because it's a simpler derivation. So the derivative, this is a line linear in terms of mu. Um, so in order to derive the Haitian, you need to take only derivatives of linear terms. So this only leaves you with the matrices. And within the sum, the xi disappears. It doesn't depend on mu, that, that term. And so you get n because it's a sum of ones of n times. So that's the Haitian. So now you're going to use the gradient that you obtained earlier to derive the solution, the map estimate. So the value of mu that maximizes the log posterior. So you basically do that by setting the gradient to 0 and solving for mu. So you should do that. OK, so for the map solution, this is the solution you obtain. 
And what I mentioned about things staying on the left, like the most important thing here is that this is a matrix that is multiplied by mu and equals something else. So in order to get this on the other side, you cannot just divide. You need to, you multiply with the inverse of that matrix on the left. And so this gives you identity on this side and the inverse on the left of that thing here. So many people used matrices and they wrote fractions with matrices. So you're, some people wrote divide by a matrix um, or a vector. But you cannot really do that because division is not defined for a matrix. You need to ha you, you have a matrix inverse. You can either multiply the, that from the left side or from the right side of the other matrix that you have. So that's what we did here. We took this matrix. We multiplied everything on the left by the inverse of that matrix. And that's how we got it on the right side of the equation. Um, so is that clear for everyone? Yes, sir. So, now we're going to go into a much more complicated example. Uh, so far, we have considered that the covariance matrix is fixed. We didn't have a prior for the covariance matrix. And many times, you would like to assign a prior to both the mean and the covariance matrix. And there are many ways you could do that. You could assume an approximation where you take a factorized distribution. You take a form for the mean and the distribution form for the variance, and you simply multiply them together. But the, the most general case is taking a joint distribution over both. And the conjugate prior joint in this case is the normal inverse wizard distribution. That depends on four parameters. And it's, it's basically a product of a normal and an inverse wizard distribution. The inverse wizard form is given down here. Um, and the normal distribution depends on sigma. And sigma is drawn from the inverse wizard. Uh, so this is not really a factorized approximation. This is a, a, a joint distribution over both. Um, for people who are not familiar, the absolute, that the absolute value notation represent, uh, represents the determinant of a matrix. And this is a gamma function. This is a multivariate gamma function. It has a weird definition, but you don't need to care about it because it will only appear as a constant term. Um, and the trace of a matrix is sum of the diagonal entries of the matrix. Okay. So we're going to do the same thing that we did before. So the first thing you need to do is to derive the log posterior. And you're going to have more time for this. And you can ask any questions you have. I'll show you the answer to this. So we do the same thing. We use the base theorem to split this down into a product. Um, and the likelihood you get in the end is of this form. This does not include the constant term. So if you have extra terms that are constant, that's correct as well. Which term? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is, it is. That's, I missed it there. That's a typo. But it's shown here. Like, that's the sigma. Oh. I'm missing one term, actually. Yeah. There is one more term. That's correct. Yeah. That term is minus a half. Oh, times n, times n. Yeah. Hmm. Weird. Nice. Good point. So now you will derive the gradient of that with respect to initially menu. And you will see that that looks extremely similar to what you derived before. So it shouldn't be. Whoa. Since so that. <laughs> I'll now show you the derivative with respect to mu. That should be, that's almost identical with the derivative that you obtained earlier. I'm waiting for them to finish looking at the slide before I change it. 
Um, so, okay, let's wait 10 more seconds. Okay, so the gradient looks like that, which is almost the same that you had earlier, because the terms that actually depend on mu are almost identical. The mu has a normal distribution still. It just depends on sigma. Here you have sigma instead of sigma zero, and you have a factor of beta as well. But the way you derive that is exactly the same as the way you derive the derivative with respect to mu. So now you're going to derive the derivative with respect to sigma. Oh, there's a problem there. Sorry about that. I need to give you some identities for that. Sorry about that. <laughs> Yeah, we write them on the board. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so the first is the derivative of the log determinant of a matrix. So the derivative of a log determinant of A with respect to A is inverse transpose, I think, yeah. The derivative of x transpose a y, a inverse y. So this is for, um, for arbitrary vectors x and y that do not depend on matrix A. You get hope people can see that. That's that derivative. And the derivative for the trace trace of so I'm giving you the general forms of these um, identities. Uh, and the reason is that if you open any reference when you derive these derivatives in real life you will get the general form and you need to learn how to use it in, your, in the context of the problem you are solving. So that's B. That's for arbitrary matrices B and C. That's equal to Yeah, I have seen that. Okay, what it says here, because Huh? Yeah, you need the trace. You need it. So this is minus A inverse C B A inverse transpose, the whole thing. Okay, for people who cannot see it from back there. I can pull that up. Yeah. So you can use those rules to derive the gradient with respect to sigma. Okay. So, because we don't have much time, um, the solution to this question is that um, the reason, the way you, so there is a plus n missing from here. It's the problem, the mistake that someone pointed out earlier. Here, plus n. So. The way you do this is that you directly apply these rules to our terms. Um, so the first term, um, you can see that this rule applies. Um, that's where you get this blue part from. The same rule applies for this term, for the pink term. And for the log determinants, we have combined them in one term. There's a plus two there, which was the other one missing from before. Um, and we directly apply this rule. The we don't need to care about the transposes because these are symmetric matrices. Um, so they're the same. And for the trace, um, we directly apply this rule where we use C as the identity matrix. Um, is that clear to everyone? OK. So now we'll derive the solution, the maximum posteriori estimate for the mean and the covariance. Oh, yeah? Not in the inverse of sigma, just 
No, it is the inverse of sigma because here we saw x transpose a inverse y. All inverse. Yeah, that gives you. So for the yeah. Uh, the menu, uh, yeah, y you could transpose the whole thing, right? That's what you're talking about, together with a sigma. You could take the norm of sigma inverse mu minus mu zero all together, right? Yeah, yeah, you can do that. That's equivalent. Because when you transpose a product, you need to invert the order of the multiplication as well. So to derive the solution to the map, uh, for the map estimate, you need to maximize with respect to both mu and sigma, and so you need to set both derivatives to zero. And as we'll see here, you obtain a solution very easily. Inter these are not um, simultaneous equations, but in more general cases, you might end up with two simultaneous equations that you need to solve, and there are many ways you can solve those. Um, anyway, so let's start by setting this term to zero and solving for mu. The solution will be very similar to the one you had before, with one small difference, which ends up being big. OK, people have started coming in because we're a little over time. So I'm going to show you the solution. Sorry about that. Or I can leave it for you to see, actually, when you get home, if you want to derive it. That's <laughs> what do you prefer? OK, I will show it to you. So. That's the solution you obtain. Uh, if you set the first the derivative with respect to mu to 0, um, the difference with before is that the sigma inverse, you, you get rid of the sigma inverse because now you don't have sigma 0 inverse and sigma inverse. You have only sigma inverse. So that factors out because it's equal to 0. And so you get a solution of mu independent of sigma. And then when you solve the derivative, when you set the derivative with respect to sigma to 0, you get a solution for sigma in terms of mu where you can plug in the solution you obtain for mu here to get the optimal solution for sigma and mu together. In, in cases where you get two simultaneous equations that you need to solve, which where the mu also depends on sigma, for example, there are many things you can do. Sometimes they might be easy to solve immediately by doing some sort of substitution. But some other times you like run an iteration where you keep iterating over these two updates until you reach an equilibrium. Um, but there are many different things you can try in that case, and it depends on, uh, on the problem you're solving. Um, so that's it basically for today. I'm going to post the slides today. I will fix the typos as well. And because this was more like an experiment to see how it is like to let you solve problems that people found difficult and help you while you solve them, we would appreciate your feedback to see whether you would want something like that in the future as well in other recitations to go through problems that people had problems with. Thank you.